a warm welcome to you all today to Mentor Moch Cymru webinar on successful management of pregnant sows and gilts. Diolchem yn minno gyda ni heddiw, thank you for joining us today. We're delighted to have Alex Sonset uh, with us for this webinar on a very interesting and important topic on, in our herds. Um, I'd just like to let you know you can, you're welcome to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen um, if you'd like to ask any questions throughout the webinar, just post them here and we'll try our very best to answer all uh, at the end as we've had a few questions coming in already too. Uh, therefore, um, without any further ado, I'll transfer you over to Alex. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I will start just by sharing my screen and we'll kick on. Okay. Good evening. Welcome to the webinar on successful management of pregnant sows and gilts. I'll just give you a brief overview of what we're going to cover this evening. Starting with preparing for service, what you need to think about um, a bit on AI and natural service. Moving on to how to diagnose pregnancy, different methods that are available. And then moving on to some of the problems that we could potentially come up against, why pregnancies fail, what the causes of pregnancy failure is, how we can work to try and prevent that. And then finishing off with a bit of feeding during pregnancy, how that can lead to helping to reduce the risk of farrowing fever. And there was a request for a little bit on uh, deformities, what causes them, how you can mitigate against deform deformities that you can see at the point of farrowing. Please feel free to put any questions into the chat box and we will um, cover them either as we go along or at the end. And um, yeah, hopefully you'll enjoy this evening's session. First things first, preparing for service, getting things right to avoid disappointment. By getting things off to a good start, you're obviously putting the building blocks in place for a successful pregnancy. What are the key things you need for successful service? Thinking about the health of the herd, what vaccinations might need to be in place in advance of service. So doing your health checks, making sure that if you're using natural service bores, that they're in good health, they've got good legs and feet, um, that you know what their health status is, so they, they're not likely to transmit anything to the girls that they're serving. Knowing what your herd health, your overall herd health is, so that you can prepare what vaccinations you might require in advance of service. Bearing in mind that if you're trying to protect a pregnancy by vaccinating, for example, with the parvovirus vaccination, that needs to be in place a minimum of three weeks before the point of service in order to actually effectively cover the pregnancy that develops from the next service that the, that the sow or gilt goes through. Thinking about what the feeding regime for the breeding herd is and what the correct nutritional level is required for the stage of um, development. Gilts will need to be fed slightly differently to how you feed a sow herd, the sows in the herd because bearing in mind that the gilts are still growing through their first pregnancy and also into their first lactation. So how you prepare a gilt for first service is slightly different to how you um, prepare a sow for return to service after she's been weaned. But making sure that you have the correct feeding in place, that you're not overfeeding, but you have a flushing effect in that run up to service. And then that you feed correctly after the point of service to get good maintenance and um, sustaining of pregnancy through to the point of farrowing. Making sure you get yourself organized with any kit that you need. The last thing that you want to happen is decide that you're going for AI, for example, and you haven't actually got everything in place to make sure that that runs smoothly. Think about how and where you're going to mate your sows and gilts. If you're using natural service, have you got sufficient space for those services to take place without either the sows, gilts or boars getting injured? What's the flooring like? Is there a risk that sows or boars might slip 
during the mating process, which could potentially cause injury. And then if you're doing AI, have you got correct semen storage facilities available? Is the fridge that you're going to store the AI in at the correct temperature? Have you got all the catheters in place, lubricant, all the those sort of things that seem obvious, but if they're not there and ready to go, then you're suddenly running up against time because if your sows and gilts are on heat, you do need to have everything prepared to make sure you hit that window properly. Otherwise, if service is delayed, you may get pregnancy failure purely because you're serving them at the wrong time with respect to ovulation in terms of the standing estrus. And then making sure that all of the girls of any age are effectively stimulated to come on heat. Proper bore presence, good bore contact, making sure that they have as much interaction with bores as possible, bearing in mind whatever method of service that you're using. So for example, if you are using AI, you potentially have some specific breed lines that you want to use, and therefore having full bore contact with an entire bore may not be ideal if you haven't got a way of preventing him physically serving the sows or gills. Therefore, you might not be able to have full direct contact, i.e. the bore in the pen with the, with the females that you're looking to serve, but you need to have good nose-to-nose -nose contact through an, an open fence line so that they can touch each other, they can smell the bore, and they can hear him. And that gives really, really good estra stimulus. You might be able to use a vasectomized bore, in which case then you are able to have full contact and allow some serving because that serving will be unsuccessful. And again, that full contact at the right time around the point of estrus will give that really strong stimulus to allow you then to go on to serve at the right point during the standing heat. We talked a little bit about vaccinations. So what do you really need to consider? Before you consider what vaccinations you're going to use, you need to know your herd health status. What do and don't you have in the way of disease? What can influence what therefore you need to use in terms of vaccinations to provide protection and that obviously then influences the correct timing of the use of those vaccines. As we've just mentioned pre-service is really key to protect the pregnancy and also some of the vaccinations that you would give in order to protect against um, diseases that would harm pregnancy can actually cause issues with pregnancy if given after the point of service apart from the fact that handling and stress around the point of service to, to deliver something such as a vaccination, the stress of that event could in itself be sufficient to disrupt a pregnancy. Selection of different things I would think about in terms of vaccination, erysipelas and parvovirus are always top of the pops really in terms of protecting that pregnancy. Other things you might want to consider dependent on herd health status and potential exposure are Leptospira, PERS virus and PCV2. And others that you might also think to consider in terms of just general overall protection of health would match up to what your known herd health status is. So, for instance, if you're EP positive, making sure that um, any guilt potentially that you're bringing into the herd match that health status so they don't meet that disease challenge at an inappropriate stage of pregnancy which might disrupt that pregnancy that is very much determined by what the herd health status that you have is because some of these vaccines you you wouldn't give if you didn't need to and they wouldn't necessarily bring any additional benefit to pregnancy protection unless there was a specific reason why that herd needed protecting or incoming animals into that herd needed protecting and just to highlight as an absolute bare minimum for a breeding herd, I would always recommend giving erysipelas and parvovirus cover pre-service, both to sows and gilts. And there are a selection of different vaccines available. Um, happily, the eri and parvo components do come as a combination vaccine. So you're not necessarily turning the girls into pin cushions by giving them multiple jabs because you could potentially cover it with um, uh, a, a single shot, although bearing in mind most starter vaccinations would be delivered as two, two doses with a, a division of weeks between those doses according to the data sheet, and that would be before the first service. 
So for instance, for gilts or sows that haven't previously been vaccinated. And then for subsequent pregnancies, it would only be a single shot after that. But please speak to your vet about uh, what might be appropriate for your herd. And therefore, you'd be able to follow the data sheet guidance on whatever vaccinations are advised based on your herd health status. We've prepared for service. And the next thing to do is actually talk about service itself. I'm going to talk you briefly through AI and natural service. In fairness, their talks on their own, just covering those areas. So I have summarised it, but please feel free to ask questions later. A couple of things to remember for AI. Correct semen storage and handling is vital. Semen is quite delicate. It's always delivered as fresh. We don't tend to use frozen semen because the efficacy of frozen semen in pigs is not as good as using fresh semen. Therefore, it has a finite life from the point of collection. It's delivered, for example, as you can see in the picture in these flat packs or alternatively in small squeezy bottles. And in that mixture in there is the semen dose plus extenders and nutrient materials, which allow the semen to remain viable for a longer period of time than if it was on its own. However, it's important that that's stored at the correct temperature and transported at the correct temperature, which is between 16 and 18 degrees centigrade. And that when it's received onto the farm, it's stored at that temperature as a constant temperature until the point it's used. During the period of storage, it's important to turn the, pack, the flat packs or the bottles twice daily to resuspend the semen within the nutrient broth that it sits in. Otherwise, the semen cells become separated from their nutrients. And at that point, you get degradation of the, the actual AI quality. Using the semen as fresh as possible is really important. As I've said, it does have a finite life, usually between sort of two to five days after collection, depending on uh, what extenders are being used. And that is something to discuss with the genetics company or breeding company that you receive the semen from. So timing the delivery of your semen uh, onto the farm to coincide as close as possible to the point of service is really important to try and maximize the efficacy of that service. As we've mentioned in the preparation section, good boar exposure is really important. And it's also vital around the point of service, having that boar contact in order to really stimulate extremely good standing heats, which allows that service by AI to take place. Patience genuinely is essential for AI. There, it's not uh, an activity to be rushed because the girls themselves won't be rushed. They will stand on heat when, it's, when they're ready. They will stand for as long as they want to. And when they're served, they will draw the semen in at their own pace. You really can't push them. And if you try, all you tend to do is lose volume by getting semen leak out around the catheter or leak out from the flat pack by trying to push, push it too hard. So it really is um, a don't rush kind of uh, job. And then after the AI has taken place, allowing the sows and gilts to rest properly and have a bit of time to just gently chill out and loaf around before they go back out to their um, normal paddock or, or barn. And that just makes sure that you maximize that uptake of semen. Don't try and pull the catheters out necessarily, let them shed them themselves and just give them that maximum time to absorb that semen into the system so that you can try and um, get the maximum service effect out of it. As we've said with preparing, making sure that you're organized is really vital because once the girl's on heat, they're ready to go and therefore you need to have everything in place. So know who you're going to serve, make sure you've got your boar ready and he's keen and he's there to stimulate, make sure that, that your boar presence is there in front of them whilst you're serving, give them some stimulation to increase that natural oxytocin relief release to um, ensure good uptake of the semen. And then working on getting at least one, if not two good services. But if you only manage to get one service in and that's a really good one, then that's brilliant. If you then manage to get a subsequent service or two subsequent services in, even better. But this is the whole thing about not rushing. One good service could be sufficient if you catch her in that right window. And then 
making sure that you're serving promptly and that you're responding to that standing heat. She's using that uh, bore stimulus to get that standing heat to be really strong so that you don't miss that window where the, um, you hit that optimum block where ovulation occurs in standing heat. With bores, if you're doing natural service or assisted natural service, it really is vital that they are health checked because if they have issues with lameness or um, other foot issues, for example, that can really put them off their stride and, and can decrease semen quality and therefore decrease the efficacy of their um, chances of serving. And therefore the fertility of the herd is, is compromised because they are half the herd if they are your only method of service. Making sure that they are worked regularly, but not overworked. Uh, and that is sort of looking in the region of doing uh, one to two, services a week but not really any more than sort of six services a week at absolute most uh, so if you're weaning four to six sows in a group you'd be looking to have uh, about two boars working that group because they're all coming on a heat simultaneously uh, just to make sure that they're not overworked because if a boar is worked too much they will start to reduce their semen quality and therefore the chances of successful service does deteriorate Size match, mismatch is really important, particularly when considering gilts, because if the bores are huge and you've got young gilts coming through, they can actually do a reasonable amount of damage to those gilts. And because of a disparity in size, they may not be able to successfully serve as well as they would a, a more mature sow who is more better, who is better matched in size, basically. The picture you can see on this slide is of one of my colleagues, uh, reducing tusk size on a boar who's used for natural service and heat stimulus because actually they can do quite a lot of damage even just a, a gentle nuzzle with with a sow with a great big set of tusks can do quite a lot of damage so making sure that the tusks are not going to injure either the sows or gilts within the herd or any of you guys that are handling them is really is also really important and when we're talking about vaccinations and worming, it's really important not to forget the boar. They mingle with the sows and the gilts uh, on a fairly regular basis. And therefore, it's important that their health status and vaccination status is matched. And if they're up to date with their parasite control, then they're in that you're making sure that they really are in tip top health. And I mentioned about habituation. Um, by that, I mean not just allowing boars to loaf endlessly with groups of females because to a certain extent if they just live with them continuously they don't have quite such an effect in terms of heat stimulus as if they spent a period of time away from the group of females that they're expected to serve and then came back and they were a bit of a surprise. We call it the surprise party effect which is where the sows haven't been in contact with the boars for a period of time and then suddenly they reappear and it's something new and exciting as opposed to, oh, well, he's here all the time. I'm not really that bothered about him. It varies as to the time of cycle. For example, after service has taken place, it is necessary to have a reasonable consistency of bore contact in order to help maintenance of pregnancy and also picking up returns three weeks after that first service. But then once they've done their role in terms of the three week returns, if no one's really been served and you think or you've had pregnancy testing done and you know that the sows are in pig, it might be worth just um, taking him away so that he's away from the girls and therefore um, he can be either used for another activity or he can um, be brought back in to stimulate again three weeks later if you think you, you may have some six week returns coming through so that that surprise party effect really does have that maximum hit because they haven't had that habituation develop. And just to clarify what happens with sperm production, it's about a five to six week cycle, four weeks of which the sperm is in the, are in the testes and two weeks it, uh, that it's in the epididymis. Therefore, it's very susceptible to temperature, be that natural body temperature or environmental temperatures. And in particular, very susceptible to raises in temperature which are very detrimental to um, sperm production so if the sow develops an infection which creates a fever 
there will be disruption to sperm production. And you will see the effect of that over the preceding uh, six weeks before uh, the resolution of the fever is noted in the point the semen starts to return to normal. Likewise, if we have a screaming hot summer and the boars are struggling to keep cool, then that will affect semen quality and volume. And therefore, you can gauge a window when you may have some impact on service efficacy based on when there was a period of hot weather where the boars might have got overheated. But again, once that period of hot weather is resolved or you've managed to come to a way of making the boars adapt to their temperature better, or keep them cooler, you will see that improvement in semen quality follow through once that period is elapsed. We've prepared, we've served, now how do we know they're in pig? What are our options for doing pregnancy diagnosis? It's a really flattering picture of me scanning sows, which uh, I tend to wheel out at this stage. Um, that is obviously one method of checking to see whether the, the sows and gilts are in pig. But basic observation for returns to service is an option and uh, Doppler ultrasound is also a possibility. Your observation option is purely monitoring for return to estrus. So signs of heat about 18 to 22 days after the initial service. Using a bore in order to help simulate those heats is very helpful because they are considerably better at doing it as it is their job. And it's pretty cheap because it just requires really good observation. And if you've already got a bore as part of the herd, he just needs to be wheeled out to go and do his job. Again, the surprise party effect works quite well. Doppler ultrasound is an older school method of listening to the sow's abdomen to see, to check for signs of um, successful pregnancy. It's an audio check for the turbulence in the uterine artery, but you can also pick up fetal movements and at later stages, the fetal heartbeats. So it can be used from about four weeks post-service because you're checking to here for that increased volume of blood flow through the uterine artery which is sort of a gushing sound and you might hear flutters of the fetal movements and also the gentle heartbeats which are obviously much more rapid than a sow heartbeat would be. It is possible to get false positives with this method because other things can cause increased blood flow in the uterine artery such as the early stages of the next estrus uterine infection and if the embryos if the pregnancy's failed and the embryos have been absorbed there will be um, a residual amount of excess blood flow to the uterus whilst the uterus involutes and goes back to its um, normal state so it can be a bit delayed from the point the pregnancy has actually failed and likewise if you scan early and you only scan once there is it's easy for pregnancies to fail after four weeks and therefore, a positive pregnancy test at four weeks, if not repeated, could easily then become a false positive because that pregnancy could be less lost at a later stage. It's also easy for inexperienced operators to, to misjudge what other noises within the, within the abdomen are and think that that's actually representative of pregnancy because obviously there are other areas where there's blood flow, other blood vessels sows move and you get quite a lot of background noise so it's not the easiest method um, and it is quite tough on the ears if you do a lot of Doppler ultrasound. This is the method that we use which is called real-time ultrasound which is where you can physically see the pictures of uh, the pregnant uterus by using an ultrasound scanner. We're different to how we, you would scan cattle for example we don't actually put the scanner inside the sow we scan from the outside of the abdominal wall using a sector scanner. So we have a cheese wedge appearance to the pictures that we look at. Again, this can be used for four weeks post-service and you actually visualize the, the uterus with the fetuses inside and you can see fetal heartbeats. It is also possible to visualize a uterus without fetuses in it and that looks like it is non-pregnant and you could also see uterine infections and the signs of estrus developing.
This is roughly the angle of the dangle where you would place the probe onto the abdominal wall just in front of the back leg under that fold of skin. This would give the, the cheese wedge appearance to the picture as you can see on the right hand side. And then when I'm scanning, I rotate the, the probe head um, forwards and backwards from the, the back of the, the pelvis through into the abdomen to give a really good sweep across the abdominal contents in order to try and visualize as much of the uterus as possible to really be sure about what I'm seeing. The picture on the right hand side of the, the slide is an image of an early stage pregnancy. And you can quite nicely see if I bring up a, a pointer. Here are the uh, uterine loops that you can see in cross section. And these little white flecks inside the, the big black blobs of fluid are the embryos and fetal membranes. And this black area is the fairly distinctive sign of, of uh, fetal fluid um, inside the uterus. And on the right hand side here, you can see another picture of a, a gravid uterus, which is slightly further on because you can see more fluid and you can just about see some fetal membranes up here and some of the fetal membranes along the edge here, the sort of roughened inside edge where you've got the connection between the, the fetus and, and the mother. And then in this picture on the, the right hand side, you can clearly see an absence of these area, big areas of fluid and circular compact areas that are speckled in gray in color. And that would give me an indication of um, a non-pregnant uterus because the, this is the uterine muscle and uterine wall all compacted down without an area of fluid in the center. And these are pictures that we've taken with our scanner whilst we've been um, carrying out scanning sessions with our clients herds. Right. We've prepared, we've served, we've checked they're in pig, but why and how do things go wrong? How does pregnancy failure present? And it does differ depending on the stage of pregnancy at which it becomes non-viable. Starting off with failure to conceive, the pregnancy doesn't really start in the first place. This would present as just a regular return to estrus. So conception is uh, a non-starter. So she comes around on cycle again, completely regularly. And there are multiple reasons why conception might fail. We'll cover some of them, but the obvious things to think about are with AI, are there issues with semen handling storage, AI technique, um, timing of AI, bore stimulus, all of those sorts of things. And with natural service, you're thinking about issues with the, the physical act of mating. Has that been successful? Have, has there been an insult to the bore that means his sperm quality has deteriorated and therefore the chances of a successful conception are reduced? We're thinking about all of those sorts of things. The next stage is a failure before sort of 10 or 11 days post-service. So this is the window where you're thinking that the, the conception has occurred but the conceptus is making its way down into the uterus and it's before implantation has actually started. Again, because implantation hasn't started, there is a lack of recognition by the body that, that the pregnancy has actually begun. And therefore that would be a regular return to estrus. And again, at 10, 18 to 22 days post-service. There may be some visible signs of an abortion, but it may just be that, that any conceptuses are resorbed into the body and there's no outward sign that the pregnancy has failed. And by abortion, it may be some different mucoserous discharge. Um, nothing much more than that, maybe slightly bloody, but it wouldn't be anything of any great substance because of it's such an early stage of pregnancy. 
The next point is when implantation actually fails. And that would be seen as an irregular return to estrus because that the, the conceptuses have got to a certain stage and then implantation has, has not been completed or there haven't been sufficient viable fetuses for implantation to take hold. And that means there has to be at least four embryos in order for implantation to be successful and for the pregnancy to continue. And by a regular return to estrus, it, I mean uh, an estrus or heat occurring not at your standard three week interval. As I've said, anywhere between 23 and 38 days post service is when you would you would see that that heat and that irregularity would indicate that there potentially had been a pregnancy, but it didn't make it past the point of implantation. And again, you may see some signs of abortion in, in terms of discharge from the vulva, but it is possible that the embryos will just be resorbed and therefore you won't see any obvious outward signs apart from a return to heat at an unusual time. And then the final point is if um, there is a failure of the pregnancy after implantation has taken place. So there's sufficient embryos for, for pregnancy to be sustained, but then there has been an insult that has caused that pregnancy to fail. That might result in a false positive pregnancy diagnosis because if scanning has taken place at four weeks and not been repeated, then uh, you may have scanned them in pig successfully and then implantation has taken place around sort of day 35, day 40 post-service, and then it subsequently failed. So she's been noted as being pregnant, but actually there's been a, a later stage failure that means that she ultimately doesn't farrow. Following on from a post-implantation failure, there are um, uh, several different things that can happen depending on the stage of pregnancy that it does actually fail and what caused the failure. And that could be anything from a pseudo pregnancy, taking them almost up to the point of farrowing and then nothing happening. What's called a nip, a not in pig, which is your false positive um, PD at an early stage that then subsequently doesn't farrow down when she's expected to. You may see overt abortion, particularly if it's in the later stages and the fetuses are, are large and are physically expelled by the body. Or it might present as... Um, mummified fetuses born at the point of farrowing either as an entirely dead litter or um, a low litter size with a mixture of mummies and stillborns as a result of maybe an infectious process that has progressively moved through the uterus and done damage throughout the course of gestation. What causes these sorts of pregnancy failures? E e you can divide them into two categories. Infectious, non-infectious. Infectious is often what most people sort of veer towards, but mostly when doing a reproductive investigation, I would say that um, a, quite a chunk of time we investigate re reproductive failures and actually it's non-infectious causes that tend to be the real thrust of what the issue is. Um, we would al always look at non -inf of infectious causes, but bearing in mind that the non-infectious is a much bigger list and much more wide ranging, that it's more likely that non-infectious causes are higher up the list of differentials as to why there's issues. With infectious causes of pregnancy failure, there's basically three broad ways in which that works. The agent either invades the placenta and causes deterioration to the nutrient flow to the fetuses so they die or they directly invade the fetuses and disrupt them, and therefore you lose them. Or alternatively, there's a disease process that affects the sow, but doesn't necessarily affect the piglets or embryos in uterus, but that fever or toxemia in the sow means that the pregnancy is non-sustainable and therefore it's lost. Top four, PERS, PARVO, LEPTO and PCV all uh, three viral diseases and one bacterial infection. These uh, act directly either in utero or on the fetuses. Then you think about other bacterial infections or other viral infections such as flu. And these tend to work in the third scenario that we've discussed above, which is causing 
disease, fever, toxemia in the sow, which then impacts on the pregnancy indirectly. And then we can't forget the notifiable diseases. CSF, ASF, brucellosis and Ajeskis all can present with reproductive issues with a selection of abortion, stillborn, mummy, weak piglets. When looking at a reproductive issue where those are present as, an, as a presentation, it's important to look at what's happening with the whole herd to make sure that you're not concerned that there might be a notifiable disease issue as the underlying cause. And then, as I said, the non-infectious list is, is fairly extensive and, and covers everything from environmental temperatures through light, nutrition, handling, and then some of the more unusual things such, such as mycotoxins. I'm going to just cover a few of these in, in a little bit more detail whilst I've got that slide up, because I know people will have questions on, on how some of these disease processes work. If I just flip to the infectious side and we talk a little bit about PERS, parvovirus and lepto specifically. Um, parvovirus, we've talked about vaccinating and how important that is in order to protect pregnancies. Parvo can af affect litters anywhere from the start of uh, the process at conception right the way through till about sort of 70 days post service. And depending on the point at which that infection comes in, it determines how it presents. So before about 30 days of gestation, you would get embryo loss. And that might be presenting as either an increase in returns, both regular and irregular, depending on the point of infection. Or um, if it's an infection from about day 30 to day 70, you would get fetal death. And then you would get a mixture of mummies, and uh, lower litter size, as well as potentially some abortions if the, the pregnancy is just expelled by the sow. And then around day 70, you would get, um, you could have an infection in day 70 and over, but the fetuses are able to clear that infection as a general rule. And therefore you don't necessarily see the, the litter effects if the exposure is later on during pregnancy. So when you, a problem with parvo is present within the herd, what you would tend to see is a mixture within litters being born of healthy, stillborn and mummified fetuses. And um, that's a hallmark because that infection moves progressively through the uterus and therefore doesn't affect every fetus at exactly the same stage, hence why you get the mixture of presentation. If you think about lepto, uh, lepto can present as infectious infertility, abortion, stillbirths, and weak piglets. Herds that I have that experience lepto, it's often related to the rodent population in the area, causing contamination to um, the environment in which the pigs live, particularly the gilts, and therefore having high exposure to the leptospira bacteria. Also, if pigs have access to natural watercourses that ha have high leptospira levels, that is uh, when you would see potential issues with lepto. There are vaccines available, well, there is a vaccine available which is combined with erysipelas and parvovirus vaccine. So if this is an issue that is diagnosed within your herd, there is a vaccination option out there. In terms of diagnosis, with, with most of these infectious causes, we would be looking to take diagnostic materials from aborted litters, be that mummified piglets, stillborn piglets, aborted placental materials and getting diagnostic information from the um, VI centers, APHA labs on that material to tell us exactly what those piglets were exposed to whilst in the uterus. Sometimes it's difficult to determine exactly what's going on just by taking blood samples from the sows, particularly if you do have a robust vaccination program in place because the vaccine can skew how the results present as to, to what's actually causing the issue. But by looking directly at the aborted piglets, you can get a much better handle on exactly what's causing that abortion. Um, PERS virus is always one that, that a lot of people ask about. This is, it's called PERS because it stands for porcine respiratory and reproductive syndrome virus. And in terms of the reproductive presentation, 
you would tend to get late stage abortions, but also in litters that have been affected, you would have um, freshly dead autolyzed piglets, also weak piglets, maybe some healthy piglets, but other piglets that are born seemingly healthy at the point of birth, but might develop respiratory disease early in the post farrowing period. It again depends a little bit at what stage of pregnancy that the litter is affected, but as a general rule, um, the virus doesn't cross the placenta until about day 90 of pregnancy. So it's usually the later stage uh, presentations that you would see, which is the, the stillborns and mummifieds and, um, and maybe uh, late stage abortions, depending on the proximity to the point of infection. Again, vaccination is available, but in terms of whether you should or shouldn't vaccinate, that really is dependent on determining your herd health status, because I wouldn't, if a herd is negative for PERS, I wouldn't rush in and vaccinate that herd unless there was a very specific reason to do so. Looking more onto the non-infectious causes, which as I've said, tend to be the uh, majority of reasons why a lot of herds suffer from reproductive issues. We have everything from heat stress causing issues with um, uh, successful conception and maintenance of pregnancy. So in, in very hot summers, you tend to see problems with fertility and the seasonal infertility tends to link to that as well. With poor lighting, um, sows that are kept in darker conditions don't necessarily have sufficient light stimulus. So making sure that sows have adequate light for between 12 and 16 hours a day is really important, whether that be by cleaning all the lights in the barn that they live in or whitewashing the walls. There's um, several ways in which you can, can make sure that that light is well reflected. Nutrition is vital. The sows coming out of a, a, a lactation in which they've had a large litter size would suffer in terms of successful conception because they may not be in the right energy state and physiological state to rebreed. So making sure that at the point of farrowing and um, going through that first lactation or, or any lactation, the sows are in reasonable body condition, but not over fat is really important. We could go on and on about a lot of these um, issues, but I'm conscious that a few of you have got questions that want asked aren't answering at the end of this. So please feel free to ask questions in the chat. So what interventions would you put in place? For the infectious, herd health status check, vital, making sure that the right vaccines are used at the right time, making sure that you're checking and quarantining incoming stock, including bores and AI, and your biosecurity is up to standard is really important. And with the non-infectious, it's a tick list going through and reviewing each of these issues and addressing what might be there as a problem and what might be a potential risk is really important. So briefly on to farrowing during pregnancy and how to reduce the risk of farrowing fever. I'll ping through this reasonably quickly because gestational feeding is usually divided into the three trimesters of gestation. So in that first trimester, you're thinking about the establishment of pregnancy, but you don't want to overface the sows with too much food, but you also want to provide them with sufficient energy for initial piglet development and placental development. Second trimester, so the mid phase of gestation, that's really, really important that you give them sufficient nutrition to maintain pregnancy and litter size and helping the piglets develop. But if you overfeed them in mid gestation, it really it negatively influences their ability to eat during lactation. If you overface them at this stage, they don't eat enough when they really, really need to when they're producing milk for their piglets. And then the final trimester, this is when the increasing demand of the litter is getting bigger and bigger and bigger as that litter is reaching the point of farrowing. So this is where you would increase the feeding rate just in that last trimester in the run up to farrowing to make sure that the piglets get adequate nutrition whilst maintaining the sow's body condition. The caveat to that is at the point you know she's about to farrow that you do cut her back a little bit in order to make sure that she just can chill out and relax as she's going into the point of farrowing and she's not feeling really, really overfaced with food. So you might be feeding an extra kilo above your base rate during mid gestation in that last trimester, but you might cut her right back down to the base rate again 
immediately peri farrowing and just after the point of farrowing. Just to say the kilo guide per day that I've put on this slide is a bit of a guide, but it is very dependent on the type of diet that you're feeding. And it's important to talk to the company that makes your feed to give an idea on what the feeding guide is for that particular diet. Farrowing fever, for those of you that don't know, is also known as MMA or mastitis, metritis and agalactia. It tends to be a problem where sows are overfed in gestation and therefore go off their food very quickly after farrowing. And as a result, develop mastitis, congested udders, might have a uterine infection, um, might have a bit of vaginal discharge. You'll notice if she's got mastitis because the piglets will often appear hungry, often because sows lie on their udder line to try and protect themselves because their udders are sore. Treatment for farrowing fever is fairly simple, broad spectrum antibiotics, anti-inflammatories and some oxidocin to help the milk flow. And that really is essential to help get that congested udder moving again. Controlling feeding around farrowing, as I discussed on that gestational feeding slide, is really important to avoid that udder edema and that congestion and also to make sure that she is not overfaced with food at the point of farrowing so that she feels like eating as she's um, gone past the point of farrowing and goes into that um, lactation period. Sometimes if sows are moved from a nice straw-based environment into a more sparse environment in a, in a farrowing crate, they can develop constipation and that in itself can, can add to the toxemia effect which drives the mastitis and the metritis. So making sure they've got plenty of nesting material, maybe some straw that they can chew on and keep that gut flow moving really well is important. Proper hygiene in the farrowing area will obviously help with uh, preventing mastitis and making sure that when she does feel like eating, she's got food that she wants to eat to stimulate that appetite, making sure it's not going rancid, troughs are cleaned out regularly and that she's got plenty of water. The, de the demand for water during lactation is vast and therefore good access to um, clean water ad lib is really, really important. Very, very briefly, because congenital deformities, again, in itself is a bit of a talk on its own. There are a selection of different things that can present as congenital deformities, some of which you can um, mitigate against because they might be nutritional causes, but others are really either developmental or maybe genetic for the, the breed that you're particularly utilizing. And therefore, if they develop, the, the answer is really just not to breed from that sow again and not to keep any gills from that litter for further breeding if they are prone to those genetic deformities. Splay legs, this can be congenital, but it could also be as a result of uh, mycotoxin um, intake of the sow uh, from her feed or the straw that she's exposed to. Atresia ani is as it appears in lambs where there's a membrane across the, the bottom that prevents passage of feces. And again, this is often um, just congenital, but can also be inherited on the family line. So if you have high incidences of that, it would be a don't breed from her or her daughters again. Cleft palate can be genetic, but can also be linked to hemlock poisoning. Thickened forelegs, again, is another genetic one that might be breed related. And congenital tremors, where the piglets look like they're sort of rocking to their own little tune, um, has a multitude of different causes, some of which are breed related. There's some which are infectious, uh, which are not to be worried about. And then some that are related to classical and African swine fever, which you would take in the context of any other clinical signs within the herd. As a general rule, congenital tremor pigs, unless they're really, really, really shaking, will gradually grow out a bit. And provided they can sufficiently eat, then you wouldn't have a problem with them. And then hydrocephalus is a potential link to vitamin A deficiency because vitamin A deficiency can cause blindness, eye problems, malformations, and issues with um, the development of the neural tube during gestation. And just to show you a couple of pictures, your splay-legged pig, often these don't do very well, but it is possible to form a little shackle with some elastoplast to try and keep those back legs together. And you can nurse them. And once they develop that strength in their back legs, some of them will do well. It's difficult because often splay legs, they've got poor muscle fibres and therefore they're often not really very viable, which is sad. 
and then you've got some real weird and wonderfuls, epithelia genesis imperfecta, um, often related to saddlebacks or large whites. Some heal, some don't, some become infected. It's basically a, a patch of skin which hasn't formed. And you would see this in different places on the body of some piglets. Cleft palates, again, uh, 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 inherited or congenital defect and often not spotted until you realize the piglet isn't doing well because they're not suckling. Uh, thickened forelegs, exactly as it says on the tin. And cyclops, again, just another unfortunate, weird and wonderful uh, malformation that can occur in utero. So, oh, um, I slotted that in because someone's asked a question about it, so I'll come back to it. Um, but now we're on to question and answer. Ellen, are you there? Oh, yes, I am. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that very informative um, session, Alex, once again. So, um, yeah, we'll go on to Q&A now, if that's OK. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen for now, but I might bring it back up again if anyone wants to look at that synchronisation slide. Yeah, no problem. Um, so the Q&A. Sorry, I'll just get the questions up. That's been um, asked through the registration um, form. So um, the first question that we have is, what is the best practice when setting up nursery pens and how many sows per pen? OK, um, I don't think there's a fixed answer as to how many sows, unfortunately. However, what I would say is your stocking rate of nursery pens is going to be dependent on the number of sows you want to nurse and how many piglets there are, because you need to make sure that they have sufficient space. As a, as a rough guide, I did just check the welfare code guidelines when you're thinking about sizes of pen if you've got a group of six or more sows you do want to have roughly a couple of meters squared per sow possibly more and obviously if you've got litters of piglets around their feet you need to have even more space so really the number of sows that you can suckle together is dependent on the area in which you can house them other things to think about with multi-suckling is the hygiene, making sure that the pens are clean, that you're removing dung and soil bedding so that the risk of infection isn't high. And also how many sows are actually suckling and how many sows are letting the others do the work, because that can affect whether you have some sows that are coming on heat early because uh, they're letting everyone else do the work in the pen and making sure that multi-suckling sows that are working hard aren't losing excess body condition. Um, but in terms of a fixed number of sows per group, not really a fixed number, very much determined by the area in which you can accommodate them and their litters. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. Um, another question, supplements for underweight piglets, and they've noted in brackets, growth possibly reduced. Okay. Um, there are, um, again, a multitude of supplements on the market which offer cure-alls and solutions for underweight and weak piglets. Most of them are based around energy, caffeine, uh, probiotics and vitamins and minerals. They're all much for muchness. Um, there's also milk, milk replacement powders such as Bolax, Faramate, all of which will help to supplement. But it is worthwhile trying to figure out why they're underweight. So is the whole litter underweight or is it just individuals? And that might be because you've got a large litter and some of them are getting pushed out. Or if the whole litter is underweight, is it that maybe there's a starvation issue? Has the sow got a touch of mastitis that's not really, really obvious and therefore she might be guarding the other, reducing her milk flow. So there might be a bit of a root cause that needs sorting out as well. But in terms of what supplements there are out there, there are quite a lot of um, oral doses that you can use that provide nutrient supplements, but none of them really replace mum. So trying to figure out why or doing some cross fostering or split suckling might be the way in which you can get better intakes. OK, great. Um, any advice for older sows? Um, eight little eight litters onwards um, and they've noted use of oxytocin um, calcium. Right. Um, most of our commercial guys don't keep sales at eight litters onwards. I appreciate that a lot of my smaller scale of producers do. Um, 
it is well known that older sows do struggle a little bit with farrowing because of their age. Uh, they're often slower, therefore you can have more problems with stillbirths or, or issues around that sort of slow farrowing process. You can use oxytocin um, if she needs a bit of help, but you have to be very careful that she hasn't got um, a closed cervix and that you're actually just ramming the piglets up against the closed cervix. So you always need to investigate whether that cervix is open and the piglets just aren't moving and also checking whether there's anything stuck because obviously again, oxytocin isn't going to work against something that's just effectively a big blockage. Mm. And there are, people do use calcium to help older girls and help girls that are, are slow farrowing or, or showing signs. If, if for instance, you've had a higher rate of prolapses in the herd, it might be an indication that there's a, a calcium issue. There are generic sort of farm animal calcium products. I did put in an inquiry with a company that makes a product called Calpharol, which we have started using to, to aid around the farrowing process. It's actually licensed for poultry, for egg uh, shell quality and bone quality. But there are products out there and they could be of use for those older girls, but it doesn't also rule them out as being useful for the younger girls too. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, would like to know about why some piglets are slow to start after birth and some are born in the sack and seem unable to get out. Most of those are related to slow farrowing issues. Um, and that might be age related, as we've just discussed. So an older sow that's that's just taking a while to pass those piglets, they get stuck in the sack because they're stuck in the process of coming out and they might have ruptured their umbilical cord, but but not made their way out properly because there's others in the way. Um, it might be that actually you do have some low viability piglets because there is a disease process going on. Some of the diseases we covered like PERS, parvo, lepto, for example, um also if there uh if there is uterine inertia again something that's often related to older girls that can slow the farrowing process down over fat cells might farrow slowly and therefore you get this sort of board in the bag um occurrence it might be that actually they weren't particularly viable so they're not able to fight their way out. So they weren't born as stillborns, but they were always going to die not that long after farrowing because they're not particularly viable. So there are a multitude of reasons. If you're having issues with it and you can't specifically link it to older sows or slow farrowings, it is worth getting some diagnostics done to see if you've got any disease processes going on. Great. Um, what is the best way to synchronize gilts? I shall bring up my yeah. screen again because I snuck this one in knowing it might be coming. So if I go back, guilt synchronization, you would usually use Regumate. This is a progesterone product which you give for a period of about 18 days. And once you finish your 18 day course, guilt should come on heat about five to seven days later. The key with synchronization for gilts using Regumate is they have got to have cycled before you put them on the Regumate because how it works is suppressing the estrus cycle and then it reboots when the progesterone goes away again. So if you haven't seen detectable heats, it's unlikely that Regumate will work. But if you have had detectable heats in gilts, so they've gone through puberty, you've seen that pubertal estrus, you've got you're confident that that's happened, then synchronizing with Regumate will be effective. Okay. okay. Um, well, this question, um, you did mention it at the beginning, but is running the ball with a couple of sows for a long period of time good practice? Should we separate them? This is the habituation that we talked about at the beginning. Yeah. Um, it can get a little bit big brother in the corner rather than sexy new chap on the block. So having a period of abstinence is worthwhile if you feel that the girls aren't really stimulated the way they should be, maybe take him away, give them a bit of a break from each other and then bring him back and see whether he has a better effect having had a, a bit of distance put between them. Okay, lovely. Um, how easy is testing the quality of Bo's, Bo's semen? Could it no specialist vet do this and what uh, yes uh it de depends i mean obviously boar semen you have the practicalities of collecting 
which uh, takes a bit of practice. But if you can collect a semen sample, if your vet has potentially some experience with maybe RAM or bore testing um, for fertility, then they've possibly already got some of the kit they need in order to look at a semen sample. And then they just need to understand what they're looking at in terms of bore semen versus the, the others, which in fairness is fairly similar. You're looking at motility and morphology, which is the same across all species. It's just whether you look for slightly different things. So they need a little bit of kit. They couldn't necessarily go from a standing start without some investment. But if they're already set up to do semen analysis, it's just the practicalities of collecting the semen. And there are guides online as to how to do that. I know AHDB Pork have guides on, on how to do semen collection. They also have their, their own semen standards, which is, is what you should look for in terms of semen quality. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. Um, there's more questions coming here too. Thank you very much for being very active on the Q&A. Uh, how many weeks before farrowing should you up the feed? I usually say about the last three to four weeks. So that's your last trimester. If you divide your... Um, your pregnancy into three months, three weeks, three days, you're sort of looking at the, the last month before they farrow down that you're looking to um, up the feed. Okay, lovely, thank you. Um, another question, in absence of a bore, when using AI, are there, there hormone sprays that work? Ooh, I believe there are pheromone sprays that are out there. I haven't really had anyone personally that's had much success with boar musk um but i'm not saying it's not worth a try because if you can't get a boar in or you're nervous about getting a boar in because of potential biosecurity reasons then it is worth thinking about it if you're stimulating gilts um in the absence of a boar i find that gilt stimulus for, for heat and then ai is quite tricky but again, it's worth a try. I do know there are musk products out there, but personally, I, I've not used them particularly because most of the people I work with have some form of bore presence, be it vasectomized or, or entire as their stimulus. Okay, lovely. I think that's the Q&A all done. But if you have any more questions, you're welcome to post them before end of the session. I'll briefly just go through what Mental Mark Cymru has available, if that's okay and then um, we'll come to a close if that's okay. Thank you very much, Alex. You're welcome. Um, so the next webinar we have coming up on the 30th of March is Pork Box Schemes, uh, Where to Start. So this will be with Caroline Dawson, Head of Agri-Food at Proma International. Um, the um, registration form will be on the website um, very soon, so keep an eye out for that. Um, we have a bedding pack sheet, um, alternative bedding ideas, um, this will be released next week. So again, keep an eye out for this on our social media and on our website. Um, Mental Health Cymru has released practical bite-sized training videos um, on many different topics, and these will be released um, every month until uh, end of August. These are on our website and social med media platforms too. So keep an eye out for these. They're uh, very useful and um, very practical videos to watch um, in these when we can have face-to-face uh, -face meetings and events. We also have a breeding record and medicine book for pigs available. Um, you're welcome to contact us to order one and we'll send a copy out to you. Uh, also, we have a herd health um, support scheme um, where you can have support to have a vet on farm to uh, create a herd health plan for yourself. So again, contact us for more information on this. Um, and yeah, if you'd like anything else, just feel free to contact us or um, email us for any more further advice or if you have any questions. And um, yeah, there we go, I think. All, no more Q&A com coming in anyway. And um, thank you very much for a very informative session, Alex. And thank you all for joining us at home. And hopefully you'll be joining us for a session soon that you've enjoyed. The session tonight. Thank you very much. Bye Alex, thank you. Bye Ellen, bye Chat. everyone. Bye everyone, thank you.